Welcome to Behind the Pages. William Dunn is with us today. William is here to talk about Sandy's gift, Walking with the Light. This is a memoir about his experience dealing with his wife who developed mental illness uh, in her 40s and his ultimate inability to save her due to very major flaws in the mental health system. Welcome, Bill. Thank you for having me. Um, let, let's start by just having you tell us a little bit about your history with your wife, Sandy. Okay. Where, where were you um, when you first met her I, like, uh, in your life? I, I was 28. I was mm -hmm. working in Manhattan on Wall Street as a U.S. government bond broker. Uh -huh. Real good physical shape, um, single. Uh, most of my friends had girlfriends at the time, were either married and I was the last one. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I walked into this party with a couple of my friends and she was standing right in front of me with another guy mm -hmm. and we just kind of locked eyes. So we kept doing the eye thing all night long mm. and one of my friends was like, what are you going to do about it? And the guy that she was with, who I thought was her boyfriend, it turned mm. out it was a first date. I didn't know this. Uh -huh. So she's, I see her in the kitchen of this house. Uh, she's dancing with him. I grabbed a girl off the wall. I went like this, dance with me. She's the one I wouldn't let go. I started to dance with, towards her and I got my Basically, I got behind her and I kept hitting my butt against her butt. Real simple. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing I know, it was her date's butt. <laughs> so I turned the girl, danced, I swung the girl around, and I went like this. Meet me downstairs in five minutes. And uh -huh. she blushed. I did it a second time. I left the dance floor. Five minutes later, she came down. I introduced myself, gave her a big kiss. She froze up. I let go. I handed her a business card. I said, there's two here. Write your name on it. And if you don't, you just might miss the best thing for the two of us. Mm -hmm. That's how we met. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, she was an outdoor girl. I was a guy who worked in the city. Um, I did a lot of activities, outdoor activities. I lived in Summit, New Jersey at the time, mm -hmm. commuted into Manhattan. She lived in, uh, she had just moved back to her parents' home in New Vernon on a six acre horse farm that was getting run down because her father mm. was retired. Yeah. So that's kind of how we met. And yeah. the book follows our lives together. And, and, and for, for many years, you lived a very happy marriage, yes. you know, just kind of a normal, happy marriage. Absolutely, Diane. I uh, had two children uh, mm -hmm. along the way. Yep. And, um, you know, we were very blessed in a lot of ways. I mm -hmm. worked hard. She worked hard. Um, financially, we did much better than most. Mm. Um, and the book in the beginning follows our ups and downs. About the first hundred pages are called Building a Life Together. Mm. Um, you know, at one point in my career, I sat, when I was married to Sandy, I sat at the 105th floor of One World Trade Center working for Cantor Fitzgerald, mm -hmm. trading futures contracts and U.S. government securities. So, you know, um, got up at 6 in the morning. No, I left the house at 10 of 6 in the morning, got mm -hmm. home at 7 on a good day. Oh, know? yeah. And so for mm -hmm. myself in the mid late 90s, that career ended. I became a financial advisor. Um, she was in a, a production area of a printing company, mm -hmm. and in, first in production, then in sales. She was able to work out of the house and handle clients, so yeah. um, we lived a normal life like everybody else. Right. Everybody yeah. has their minor spats and disagreements yes. and frustrations, but it sounded like you had a very, you know, a very nice marriage and a very nice relationship. Yes. Yes. Um, her father died just a few months um, into your dating, and you really stood by her, and then at one point, you know, as you were sort of, um, uh, I think it was at his, uh, the site where he, his ashes were interred, uh, were uh, buried, you sort of gave, made a promise that you yes. would always take care of her. Mm -hmm. and, how, um, did th how did that start to, I mean, in earlier in your, in your marriage, you did take, I mean, you always took care of your family. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I kind of knew that once, we, we were dating about three months when her father passed away, mm. unexpectedly. He had a heart attack uh, just before I was supposed to play golf with him on Father, the day after Father's Day, or the day before Father's Day. Mm -hmm. um, so and then, then I had planned a trip the following Monday to the Hilton Head, mm -hmm. and he was awaiting transport to go to Philadelphia to bypass. They were waiting for, uh, basically waiting for space, mm -hmm. and he had a secondary heart attack and passed away in the hospital. So I flew back early from the trip. Um, 
And at her internment, I kind of knew she was the girl for me. Mm -hmm. We'd only been dating about three or four months, and you know, I'm at that stage of building a life. I'm starting to accumulate money. I'm going, okay, well, at some point, I'm going to buy a wedding ring. I'm going to do this, but mm -hmm. it takes time. I mean, I was just a kid, as I wrote in the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. My, f I had a paper route. My father owned a stable. I shoveled horse manure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wasn't good enough to work for the partners on Wall Street. And ten years later, they had to call me mm -hmm. to trade bonds of candor. So. Um, the book kind of chronologizes all of that mm -hmm. it, it, fairly quickly. Yeah, you know, and as I said, the ups and downs. So um, once we we dated for three years, we mm -hmm. were engaged for one. We actually bought our house together mm -hmm. before we were married, about six months because a house became available. Um, my wife's mother had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's mm -hmm. by the time we were engaged, and we decided we would try to find something close by so that she could be there to take care of her mother. Mm -hmm. Years later, we had to move into there to help assist with her, as you know. Yeah. So, um, so throughout all of those years, uh, were there any kinds of behaviors you were seeing that made you feel concerned? None whatsoever. I mean, mm -hmm. my wife is the type, of, I, I, I describe her as a giver. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people that are takers. Um, when we were involved with the school and the PT, she, you know, when somebody would come to the new town from the school system, mm -hmm. she's the first one with the welcome wagon introducing herself and mm -hmm. welcoming new people to the area. So yeah. we had a really good, a good marriage. Um, mm -hmm. She was outgoing. I tend to be a little quieter, not as much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, and. Um, Everything was fine. I never saw a thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it was almost like, as I said earlier in one interview, um, like she was Gail Sayers, the best running back in the world. Mm -hmm. And then in a very short period of time, somebody chopped, locked her knees, they went out from underneath her, and this mm -hmm. illness came on fairly suddenly, mm -hmm. as I've described in the book. Yeah. There might have been some warning signals I did not see. Mm -hmm. um, the summer before she was involuntarily taken from her home, we were on a vacation. We came back early to go to a wedding in Long Island. There was an incident at the hotel in which she got a spooky look on her face and said we couldn't stay here. She had booked the hotel. Other relatives were staying there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, come on, we've driven four and a half hours after 700 miles a day before. Yeah. Okay. And we went out to lunch. And we were in a nice restaurant on the water in Long Island Sound on the North Shore. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there. We've ordered our food. And within about three, four minutes, she turns bright red. The mm -hmm. color of her coral blouse, as I describe in the book. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, a couple of minutes later, sweating profusely. And I was like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. I said, let's go take a step outside. I said, are you all right? Do we need to go to the doctor? And she discloses to me, I'm going through the change of life at the age of 46. Mm -hmm. As I say, early, but OK. Yeah. And for a year, I believed that she was seeing doctors. Mm -hmm. I would later find out that was not the case. Right. She was lying to uh, me. But for a long time, you believed the, that the things you were seeing that were odd behavior were due to menopause. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And, and I kind so of look of back now and reflect that maybe yeah. the early onset of this started in 05. I can now look back reflectively. Mm -hmm. But, you know, even with the, when you're dealing with somebody you've lived with for 20 years, yeah. if there's a slow projectile, you don't see it. Right. And then certain instances came, to, as you know, came to pass. Yes. Um, so was that time at the hotel where she kind of refused all of a she, sudden said I can't stay there? We got this place and she said it was called Santorini's on Long Island on the North Shore and there were old Greek Renaissance statues. It was probably built in the 40s or right after World yeah. War II and it was kind of odd, old and outdated, but there were 25 or 30 other people from the wedding staying there. Yeah. And she said this is a mafia place, this is a safe. I said knock it off, come on, Just knock yeah. it off. And this was out of the blue. Right. And then in the December, just before Christmas, the kids were saying some things to me that mom's doing some oddball things. Mm -hmm. And I discussed to her, I said, Sandy, after the new year, another thing happened. And I said, Sandy, you know, what's going on with the menopause? What are the doctors saying? Yeah. Oh, you know, she starts giving me the end around, mm -hmm. or, which I think is fine. I said, well, you want anything? No, the doctor says I don't need anything. I said, well, you need to go back. Mm -hmm. More instances occurred, okay? She broke down my daughter's do door in an argument. I came mm -hmm. home. I repaired it. In May, it happened again. But she actually broke down a door. Broke I mean, down the door. Uh, banged and on a door. My daughter, so hard. my oldest daughter, said, "Mom is acting weird. What mm -hmm. do you mean? I don't." And she mm -hmm. couldn't come up with it. And as I've described in this book, which I later learned, which is quite frankly typical of a schizophrenic, which I mm -hmm. think she was. Yeah. Um, I described the light switching going on and off. One mm -hmm. moment fine, the next out of nowhere, this odd behavior. Mm -hmm. 
But um, early on, you weren't really thinking anyone was in danger, right? I mean, you were. It sounds like you were. Pretty I thought much it was menopause. Okay. I really did. Yeah, and you thought it was situational, like and maybe a fight with with correct. your daughter. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you were able to explain a lot of things away to symptoms of menopause or just normal teenage mom. Correct. You know. Um, correct. Yeah. Uh, uh, conflict. Yes. Um, but then, at a certain point. In you the summer, a few incidents occurred, and I finally, I got calls from my kids a couple of times going, Mom's doing it again, and finally I, can't, I drove home one day, mm -hmm. I said, what's going on? And I said to my oldest daughter, Mom's acting weird. I'm like, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. Just acting weird. And I hadn't seen any of this. Um, I thought about the incident the previous summer, and I said to her, I said, what's the doctor saying? Yeah. Oh, well, the medications I'm on it. I go, well, then go get them changed or figure it out. Yeah. Uh, about a month later, my daughter, um, on my, on my oldest daughter's birthday, she wouldn't go out to dinner with the three of us for and, and a couple of family members for a birthday dinner. I'm mm -hmm. like, what's going on? Acting up pretty odd. The next day we sold her our my mother's house. Mm -hmm. Check was issued us. She thought my brother and sister came to receive their portions of the check from the estate when I remember the past. Mm -hmm. And she thought she claimed that we sold her house. I said, how can we do this? It's in your name only. And then Half hour and you later. were living in that house. How would it I have understand been that? Yeah. And I'm, yeah. I looked at her. I said, you know, you better go do something with this menopause. I said, the doctor. I said, whatever the doctor said, you got to find something else. Mm -hmm. I was just so busy between work and yes. the six-acre horse farm working on when I got home. Yeah, and you did a lot of uh, renovation a, a yourself. Yeah, there's 368 yeah. pieces of split rail fence that go to my right armpit. Okay. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, an incident occurred about two weeks prior to her being removed from the house. She jumped from a moving vehicle. We were heading up to the Catskills. She was mm -hmm. asking us where we're going. This went on for quite some time. And she finally got in the car. As we drove up the hill, I heard a noise. My youngest daughter screams in the back seat. I see her rolling on the, f on the dirt, on the road. Mm -hmm. I get out, and I'm like, what is going on here? Yeah. I said, we're going to the doctor right now. I won't take my pills. We get her back up. We bandage it. I said, she goes, let's go to the mountains. OK, we go. Let's go to All weekend to, long, to we're up in the camp in the Catskills, oh, and we had. Uh -huh. Didn't see an ounce of anything. Mm -hmm. Went tubing down the river. Saturdays came back Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, week before the the Sunday before she was involuntarily taken away from the home in a straitjacket, mm -hmm. I saw an article in the Star Ledger or the Daily Record, the Sunday paper, because those are the only ones I get. And there was an article showing a boy, Jack Leminski, a 12-year-old boy, who had been sh strangled by his mother. The article stated she had mental health issues. Mm -hmm. The father and, the, and he were separated. He had the oldest 17-year-old. The judge had given custody to her of the mother on the 11-year-old who was now 12, because in New Jersey, the judge determines that the age of 12 or under mm -hmm. where the child goes. Father talked about mental issues. Mm -hmm. Eventually, she was you know, found in, uh, not guilty due to mental in, in, health yeah, issues yeah. for committing to her, all right? But she was charged with murder. She basically suffocated and slashed her wrist. As soon as I saw that, I started to go. I started connecting these dots and I mm -hmm. went, uh-oh, Yes. I hope this is just menopause. Well, because there had been some other kind of odd incidents, including her refusing to go away on family vacations and family weekends. Prior to that, yeah, the couple yeah. years prior to that, and I understood why when her mother mm -hmm. was staying with us and some other issues, and I go into the details in the book, and I, yeah. you know, it's really in the book there, all of those issues, but right. and that's why I'm saying I'm looking back. But I mean, now you'd be going, all packed up to leave for. Um, I'm looking yeah. back now, going. Those were probably early indications, but I didn't see it. Yes, I didn't right. see it because well, everything was normal right. prior to that. And so that summer, things got very odd. Mm -hmm. um, that evening, she says to me, "When I read the story, what you're reading, I show. It. I, said, I don't want to show it first. She looks. She reads it in a very odd voice to me. Goes, I would never do anything like that. Now, my daughter's bed had been taken apart, and we were waiting for delivery of a new mattress, a new bed, so her mattress mm -hmm. is on the ground. That evening, the next morning, I woke up, couldn't find my wife, I didn't know where she was. I thought she was in the barn working. I didn't see her. I finally see her. I see her laying down to my daughter's, laying next to my daughter with her mattress on the floor, dogs mm -hmm. next to her. What I didn't see, which my youngest daughter disclosed to the police and to the state officials of DIFUS, which is the Division of Youth and Family Services, mm -hmm. on Friday when they took her away, Mom was sleeping next to her with a 14-inch carving knife like this when she woke up with the knife pointed down, this mm. far from the mattress. Mm. I didn't see it, the knife in her possession when she mm -hmm. was laying on the floor. That led her to uh, involuntary confinement to St. Clair's Hospital. Mm -hmm. In the state of New Jersey, within 20 days, there must be a hearing. Um, so let's just, before we get into the hearing, uh, talk a little bit about that first 
that that hospital stay where she was involuntarily committed. Okay. Um, um, because there are some important things yes. that happened there. Um, while she was there, she was non-cooperative. She mm -hmm. wouldn't sign any f sort of forms that allowed the hospital workers to discuss anything within this case. And I don't know, but we discussed this earlier, mm -hmm. I believe that's the case of the law in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I live in Florida, they have that what's called a Baker Act, completely different laws. Mm -hmm. So we had a couple of, we had a group meeting where I went in which the doctor ended because she kept interrupting and jabbering and he said, you can't interrupt and he finally got up and closed the meeting. And in that meeting I said to the doctor, I said, look, you know, what's going on here? And he says, I can't tell you, he says, your wife's in denial why she's here. And I said, well, look, you can tell me. She just signed the papers. He goes, she hasn't signed anything. Mm -hmm. The entire time she was in the hospital, according to records, she actually jokingly stated she thought she was in a reality show. Mm. It's, it's in the documents, in yeah. the back of the book. Mm -hmm. And so, unfortunately, I went to go to her hearing on, I believe it was Friday, August 19th, or no, I believe it was the 19th, or whatever, did, no, it was the end of the, it was a Friday before Labor Day weekend. Mm -hmm. I was notified there was a hearing. I went. Um, I was barred from being allowed to her hearing mm -hmm. because she didn't want me there according to what the people said at the hospital. An act it, but she was at that meeting. She, she was at that meeting. Okay. And she, hired right. a, and, a, and she wanted a public defender. Mm -hmm. And the public defender cited to Judge Robert J. Brennan that police reports, reports from Dyfus of the knife mm -hmm. jumping from the automobile, in his court of law they were considered inadmissible evidence and he threw them out. He overruled doctors who believe she should go to a long-term facility. So her doctor said she needs inpatient long-term yes. care. Yes, and that because I was sent home, I was making phone calls and mm -hmm. expecting a phone call about 5 in the afternoon. About 3, 3.30, the phone rang. Colleen Lopez calls me. She says, Mr. Dunn, um, the, you have to pick your wife up. I'm like, why? He goes, well, the judge overruled the doctors and sent your, you're sending your wife home. And I said, how could they do this? And they said to me, in the last 10 years, they can only walk call one time this was done. So do you think she was in one of her reasonable moods where she could be articulate? Because it was still sort of on and I, off. I don't know. She yeah. was very, according to the court records, she didn't say much. She didn't say mm -hmm. anything. Okay. Oh. So, the so what would make a judge go against the recommendations of MDs who had been caring for her for 20 days? Ask him. Yeah. Ask him. So, but do, so you, you don't able want to know what I'd like to Yeah. But you were never, never able to meet with him and ask that question, were Well, you? actually, I tried to because mm -hmm. um, he ruled that Dyfus must monitor the household. Our caseworker arrived on September 13th, a Monday, I believe that was a Monday evening. Mm -hmm. She was to start outpatient, so I had to pick her up on Sunday of Labor Day weekend. Okay, but, but before you go into that, let's make it clear, she was not committed to a, a long-term facility, no. but the deal was that she had to attend outpatient therapy Correct. and... Correct, I am. Yeah, okay. So uh, outpatient therapy was begin on Tuesday. Tuesday mm -hmm. came and went, she didn't go. I had to get the kids to the, get their school supplies because things were a jumbo. I mm -hmm. also went to see the teachers, the principals of both schools saying that there's a court order that says she's not allowed here. One, mm -hmm. of, the, one, teach, one of the principals was sympathetic the other one said, I'm not going to do that. And I basically said, if you let my wife pick my daughter up and if anything happens to her, you will never work in a school for the remainder of your life. Mm -hmm. And I reminded her that I, I paid her salary through the taxes I pay. Mm -hmm. um, so she didn't go Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night. I said to her, if you don't go, I'm calling the hospital and the police as instructed to do so. Mm -hmm. She reluctantly went. Um, a week or so later, on the 13th, our caseworker arrived. She went to see the house. She talked to me. Um, and Sandy was acting pretty erratic. Well, at not that meeting, so right? much on. Uh, she was reclusive. Yeah. Okay. But Dis she wasn't normal. Yeah. Yeah, you know, but very reclusive. Mm -hmm. Just answering, and I had to make sure the house was cleaned up. So the caseworker said, "I'll be back here in two weeks. Every two weeks, I have to come." Mm -hmm. On the twenty seventh of November of d September, when she was supposed to come, things were out of hand. Things weren't working. Medications she was on were not working. Mm -hmm. I was watching her take them in the morning and night because I wanted to make sure. Yeah. So what happens is uh, I go to see the caseworker. She's not there. I see the head of the hospital. He says well, to me, well, yeah, I think you're actually skipping a step. So the, this, the social worker was supposed to come to the house well, because the, you were... That evening. Oh, but okay. But that morning because right. things were so disboomed in the house, the yeah. kids were withdrawing. I went to see the hospital myself to say, look, things aren't working here. Mm -hmm. We need to change meds or do something. The caseworker wasn't there. And Dr. Cattini, who headed the outpatient clinic, said to me, 
he talked with me. He said, your wife shouldn't be here. She needs to be long-term. I said, well, please call the DIFAS worker. Mm -hmm. Explain this. He made a call to them. They never returned the call. Our caseworker never showed up for another two months. Um, she stopped going out of desperate. There was And you were trying to keep her informed that things had really yeah. deteriorated, too. Exactly. I, I was mean, straightforward it, about this. We have yeah. to do this as a family to move forward. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, in other words, this is a caseworker who was assigned. She was, she was given some information about your wife's potential instability. She came once when your wife was maybe not totally erratic, but not normal either, and then didn't show up again, she, the, even the though she was The records, uh, yeah. Diane, indicated they expected that she would be noncompliant. Mm -hmm. These were written in their records. Yes. This caseworker came and then dropped the ball. She didn't come. I mm -hmm. She was supposed to come that evening. She never came. I called and called and called. I just mm -hmm. went on for months on end. Um, she stopped going to her therapy things in the middle mm -hmm. of October. Things started, she stopped going less and less and less, mm -hmm. finally stopped. I was at a group session that was supposed to be on, on Halloween. She didn't appear. I went to the police. She wouldn't, they didn't help. Two days later on the second, the case for, or no, on, on October 31st, the case, I said, look, my kids want me to take them out of the house. This, it's, we're, we're living with Dr. Jekyll and Mrs. Hyde, as I remember. Mm -hmm. And um, basically, the caseworker whispers to me, the door's closed. She goes, don't leave her. I think she might be suicidal. Then I'm going through the police. I'm talking to the police about this. Mm -hmm. I actually went around the caseworker, called her boss. Mm -hmm. I would later find out they sent somebody. A week, a couple of days later, they called me. I would later find out in court in documents that apparently someone in the Harding Township Police told the caseworker, that not the caseworker signed the case, somebody who showed up that, I don't know who said it, Mm -hmm. But it's in their documentation that uh, Mr. Dunn is trying to get the upper hand in his divorce and wants custody of the children. I'd been in the police department four times, mm -hmm. as we discussed earlier, twice with the chief of police. No report exists of mm -hmm. those. So um, I went through hoops and bounds. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, 90 days after uh, she was discharged from the hospital, my 12-year-old daughter found her mother in a suicide. Mm -hmm. My gut felt something was wrong. I did some soul searching and mm -hmm. I decided to find it uh, follow litigation I found I talked to one attorney he didn't believe anything I said I found another one mm -hmm. and we filed litigation 60 within 60 days you must file in New Jersey and we filed on the 60th date against the state mm -hmm. and later on I would find out it took six years and I would find out that <laughs> field notes were shredded documents were altered um, I could go on and on. It's yeah. in the book. I've, I've got it there. I, and I've got yeah. the documentation well, we'll, to back we'll it up. We'll leave something for the viewers <laughs> so yes. that they can buy the yes. book and read it. Yes. But, um, you know, sort of getting around to the, the larger, you know, issue here, uh, which is the mental health system. Yes. Which really did not it's serve her broken. needs or it's your broken. families. Yeah. And, you know, I've said this on a couple of interviews already. Um, mm -hmm. Breast care and aware and Aerosmith, 257,000. One will be diagnosed, 40,000 will die of it. We have roughly, according to statistics from the Bureau of Mental Health, which I put in here, mm -hmm. almost 6% of 270 million people or 15 million people are severely in, in need of help like mm -hmm. my late wife was. 26.2% um, of every single adult over the age of 18 also has some sort of phobia, health issue, disorder, mm -hmm. bipolar, you name it, it's in there. I put all the statistics there. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I've thought this over, and, you know, if this can happen to me, yes. I said, who else? And I, you know, as I said on a recent TV interview, mm -hmm. ask Rosie O'Donnell. She left The View in February, the end of February 2016, citing personal family issues. Mm -hmm. Five months later, she's looking for the public at large to help her locate her 17-year-old adopted daughter and the dog with a mental health disorder. Mm -hmm. um, now that the daughter's 18, good luck because your hands are tied. Yeah. Because within that portion of the HIPAA law, the Privacy Act, um, once a child becomes 18 or your spouse, mm -hmm. without written consent, nothing you can do. Mm -hmm. and my, that's what I. That was the hurdle that I found. Now, whether yeah. or not that was all of it from to speaking to you earlier, yeah. correct or what on. That's what I was always told was the hurdle and the roadblock. Mm -hmm. So my wife, until October 31st, was the first I heard she might be suicidal. Mm -hmm. They had that in the pl in the police reports. Mm -hmm. They, I mean, in the uh, hospital reports the whole time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know. Yes. 
Well, some of the things, especially you're being told, well, I can't get that information from you, which actually is not part of the HIPAA law. You can give information. They may not be able to share the, her diagnosis with you if she's refusing to let that happen, but you are allowed to give information, which All is very hard to do. All I can tell you is what I do. was told. Yeah, no, but as that's what I'm saying, that I really see that that the, the law needs some adjustment, but also people who work within these fields need to know what the law is. Um, because at one point when she wasn't going to therapy, you went to her uh, therapist and said, she's not coming. They said, call the police. And the police said, there's nothing we can do. These groups need to know whose role is what. Mm -hmm. and, and then what do you do when things aren't Well, the reason working. I got the litigation in is I, mm -hmm. I met a friend of mine at a fly fishing show down in Somerset. They have one up here in Boston, mm -hmm. same group. In January, it was the time was running out, and I told him, he said, how's everything going? And I said, John, I got some unfortunate news saying he passed away. He goes, what happened? I said, let's go get a Coke. Mm. We sat in a hotel, and I explained to him, he says, Bill, I'm a police officer. Something's wrong here, and mm -hmm. I think your police department's involved. That's what he said to me. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I regret that I didn't file litigation personally now against the police of Harding Township, mm -hmm. particularly what I found out after receiving the documents. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, I don't believe that the, this, this particular portion of law works when it comes to mental health. And I mm -hmm. said this the other day is that, uh, look, we had a gentleman in the military. He went to the FBI in Alaska or the CIA and said, I'm hearing voices. Mm -hmm. um, they're telling me ISIS says to kill people. Mm -hmm. He flew to Fort Lauderdale, got off a plane, killed five, shot eight of us critically, put mm -hmm. his hands on his head like this and waited for them to come. Mm -hmm. Mental health. And so right. when it comes to the gun laws and mental health, um, Mm -hmm. There should be notification, and everybody says that the gun, and I keep saying, no, it's the person that's got the gun. Well, that's the whole thing. Should guns be in the hands of people who have mental instability? Do we and, want and them in, to have And in my book, no. I discuss yeah. how I had guns in my home, and as soon yeah. as my wife was released, I went and took them out. They all yeah. had safety locks, and I gave them to Scott Noyce, my neighbor, mm -hmm. who lived on a private road right behind the police station, and that was my first conversation with the chief of police, saying, look, I'm worried here. Mm -hmm. This guy overruled. You, you took, they took pens out of, they took a knife out of her possession that she was carrying. Yeah. When they took, I said, she was sleeping next to my daughter with 14 inch carving knife. I don't know what to do here. Mm -hmm. So am I- And the police didn't really help you at all. In, well, in as that, I said right? to one interviewer, you know, based upon what I read, you know, they wanted to do an autopsy when they came and found her at the house. Uh -huh. um, and I didn't want to discuss how it died then. And I was like, what do you need an autopsy for? You're the ones who found her. Mm and after my daughter called her, and my belief was because of this rumor circulated in the Harding that I beat my wife and chiz, they were looking for that. They were looking for bruise marks, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I can't prove that. Mm -hmm. but it seems pretty odd to me that I've gone out, I've reached out for multiple times for help, and you need yeah. to perform an autopsy on someone that you find in the condition she was in. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I think they were looking to cover their asses personally. Yeah, probably. That's what I think. Yeah, so. yeah, well at that point, yes. So we have only a minute or so left, but what advice would you have for someone who is going through a similar experience? If you're going through a similar situation, if you have to lie like a son of a bitch and said the patient is going to hurt you. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, there's other aspects of this book, the religion, the spiritual thing that are completely bizarre because I met a world-renowned medium that I didn't even know who was a medium, and my late wife says gave me messages from beyond. That's mm -hmm. why it says walking with the light. I got messages and you know, mm -hmm. um, I would say to families, follow your intuition because even as you said, some of the experts don't even know what's going on with mm -hmm. regard to this. And right. um, you know, your hands are gonna be tied. And mm -hmm. so I've written this because of, as I talked to Gloria, she said to me in December of 14, she's, I called her, she said, Bill, your wife came to me three days ago. She has a message for you. You need to finish it. I said, what? You need to finish it. Then I went on to say, I've written a book. And I said, Gloria, can I use your last name? Her name is Gloria Wyken. Mm -hmm. She's internet, I didn't even know until January 15, I had to rework this. She's internationally world renowned. Mm -hmm. I didn't seek her out, she found me somehow, mm -hmm. and it changed me. And I thought, if I can write this, just one family, as I said in the book, if I can write this, yeah. Sandy say write it and tell my story so that just one family is spared mm -hmm. the hardship and grief that you guys went through, mm -hmm. my passing is not in vain. So mm -hmm. that's why I did it. Well, I'm sorry though that you had to go through the experience yes. that you and did. My, my hope yes. is no one else has to, and if they read this, yes. it might prevent some. Let's hope. You have been watching Behind the Pages from the staff of 22 City View. I'm Diane Goshkarian. And thank you for being with us. Thank you, Diane. Yes, yes. Very compelling book. Um,
But like I said, I, I really do think that um, the laws, you know, when somebody is unstable, there has to be a guardian.